Morning, church. Morning, Morning Paul. <clears throat> Let's go ahead and pray. Father in heaven, thank you for the opportunity to gather together today to, to sing songs of praise and to talk about you and your word and to fellowship with one another and to just worship you. Lord, we ask that you give us eyes that see, that see you working in our lives and in the lives of others, eyes that see the direction you want us to go in our lives. We ask for ears that hear, ears that are willing to listen to you, ears that want to absorb the information that you have for us, the words that you want us to learn. We ask for hearts that are obedient, that are cheerful, that are enthusiastic, that are, are geared towards loving and supporting one another, and that above all yearn to be your servants. We ask that you bless our worship this morning. May everything that we say and everything that we do be a blessing to you and to one another. And in your son's name we pray. Amen. A newly licensed pilot was flying his plane on a, on a cloudy afternoon. And when the time came for him to land his plane, he started to get panicky. He couldn't see where he was going to put the plane down. He didn't know what to do. And so over the radio tower comes a very stern voice. And this voice says to him, if, if you just settle down and you listen to the instructions we're giving you, We'll take care of all of those obstructions. We'll get you in nice and safe. Well, the man had a choice to make in that scenario, as do we all when we're panicked or worked up. When the, the world around us seems a little cloudy and confusing, we have a choice to make. Do we, do we try to land the plane on our own and hope that it comes in smooth and safe? Or do we listen to the radio tower that is the instructions of Christ? I don't know if it's a true story, the one I just shared. We tracked it down in an old devotional book. But the situation it talks about, that is true, isn't it? Like we just said, we have a choice to make. Who are we going to listen to? And who do we put our faith in when visibility becomes limited? Do we trust in ourselves to figure out what we're going to do? Or do we trust in God? Do we lean on conventional modern teachings? Or do we feel that we've got this? Recently, I was having a conversation with, with a young person. They're not a member of our congregation, but they said something to me along the lines of, well, that might be a morally true statement for some people, but it is not a morally true statement for all people. And if you were with us yesterday, you heard Bren talk about that very thing a little bit towards the end there, how how it has become the norm for us to have my truth and your truth, and you can't interfere with my truth because, well, it's my truth. Phrases like this really get under my skin, y'all. They're problematic, and they're growing in popularity amongst the members of our society. You'll hear phrases more and more often, like the my truth statement or the morally true statement, but what about... Well, I know what the Bible says, but what I believe God actually means is this. That's a dangerous, dangerous philosophy to live your life by. To conclude that truth is something that's somehow subjective, that it's relative. To conclude that morality is something you can pick and choose and copy and paste to suit your desires and your needs. That's a dangerous way for us to be flying our planes, isn't it? We're ignoring the teachings of Christ if morality is what we choose it is instead of putting God's instructions first. Without his involvement, our planes are going to crash. We can't see how close we are to that ground. And it's coming up fast. We need to be flying in obedience to the voice over the radio set. Flying in obedience to God's will and his instructions. Trusting that he's going to do what he does and take care of any obstructions we might be facing if we simply trust and obey. 
It's like that old hymn says, isn't it? You know, trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus. Y'all didn't know I was going to do a solo. You're welcome. I'll be here all week. <clears throat> but the song's correct. What we've been singing for generations is correct. All we have to do to be happy is to trust and obey the teachings of Christ. It's simple. Simple doesn't necessarily mean easy, though, does it? And we will talk about that in just a moment. But first this morning, we're going to conclude our series on the Sermon on the Mount. We've come to the point where I feel we need to wrap it up, where we need to talk about what we've learned so far, because there has been a lot of information that Jesus gave to his disciples when he was on that mountainside. In fact, there's so much information that we spent more time in Matthew than I originally thought we were going to when I suggested we do this. So I'm confident there's at least one of us out there going, oh, we're done with Matthew. But before we can celebrate that we've moved into other portions of the Bible, we need to take a moment to remember what Jesus said when he saw the multitudes, when he went up on the mountainside and when his disciples came to him. It's here in Matthew 5, verses 3 through 12, that we learn some of the behaviors and the people that God blesses. We see him start first with the poor in spirit. He blesses those who know that they can't, but God can. He blesses those who understand that God is paramount, that God is the most important thing for their life. He blesses the poor in spirit. We see him comfort those who are in mourning. He says, the meek are going to defy all odds. They're going to overcome all obstacles. They're going to inherit the earth. Those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, they're going to be filled. They'll find what they're looking for. They'll be satisfied. The merciful obtain mercy. The pure in heart get to see God. The peacemakers get to be called his children. And those who were persecuted for him inherit the kingdom of heaven. Jesus also taught us in this sermon that we're called to be salt and light. That we're supposed to be in the world but different than the world. We're supposed to make an impact on it. The way salt and light do in their environments. Changing the world for the better. And guiding people in the direction of Christ and his teachings. Here on the mountain, he taught us that he was going to raise the standard of expectations for the followers of God. He says, I did not come to abolish the law, I came to fulfill the law. And then he explains what that means. He talks, we, we learned a little bit about how the Old Testament law was a law that was never going to be fulfilled in perfection. How its followers, no matter how good-natured and, and how driven they were, they were always going to fall short. And we talked a little bit about how that was kind of the point. How the old law served as a placeholder for the coming of Christ. How it was designed to point people towards the need of God. Towards the need of His hope and His grace and mercy. And ultimately His Son, His solution for salvation. And then Jesus told us that as he was bringing that law up to date, as he was fulfilling it with his presence in his life, he explains to us that what God intended when he said some of these things isn't what man understood. For example, he talks about murder in Matthew 5, 21 through 26. It's here where he talks about the old law. He says, you have heard it said, do not kill, but I say, he's fulfilling it here. He's raising that standard of expectations just a little higher. He says murder is bad. Hating people is just as bad. Don't do that. He explains to us that insults and harsh words and allowing conflict in our relationships, that that is just as devastating and crippling as murder would be. We're just as capable of building people up with our words as we are destroying them with our words. Here we, we see him tell us that we need to reconcile. 
with our brothers, with our adversaries, and that we're supposed to do it quickly before the situation becomes worse. He doesn't want us to allow hard feelings to get in the way of relationships or love. We then moved on to Matthew 5, 27 through 30. And here we see Jesus give us stern warnings about the damage that sexual sin and lust can have in our lives. Here he tells us that we need to do everything we can to remove temptation from our life. He equates it to cutting off a limb or gouging out an eye. He says, it's better for you to enter into heaven maimed than to not enter into it at all. So we learned here that we move temptation away from us. Matthew 5, 43 through 48, he tells us to love those who do wrong to us, to pray for those who persecute us, and to do all we can to bless the people, especially those we feel don't deserve it. Here he remind, we, we talked about how all people fail, how all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, and, and how we're all sinners And so we need to be patient and graceful with other people. Because if we seek God's mercy and His grace and His patience, we have to give it to others as well. Later on, we learned something that is sometimes called the Lord's Prayer. And as we studied that, we saw some aspects of prayer that Jesus wants us including when we talk to the Father. He starts with praise, reminding us that it is important that when we enter before God, that we do so in reverence and honor. It's an amazing privilege we have as his children to go before him. And so it must be done with respect. We were taught that we have to always pray that his will be done, not ours. We talked a little bit about how that is an act of faith. It's an act of trust. To, to believe and to give up that much control, but to believe that God is going to take care of you in the end, even when it doesn't make sense, that is an act of faith. And Jesus wants to see that. He tells us to bring our needs before God. Give us this, this day our daily bread. That is another wonderful privilege we have, isn't it? We have a God who cares what's on our hearts. He cares what's happening in our lives. And we have the ability to talk to him about it. The God of all creation cares enough to hear what's going on in your life. And when we pray, we communicate that. He told us that we need to ask God to help us forgive other people when they do wrong against us. And we need to ask him for forgiveness as well. Then later on, we learned what it means to store up our treasures in heaven. That our earthly treasures, that they're unreliable because they can be lost or stolen or damaged, destroyed. But that heavenly treasure, treasure that is built up and stored up in heaven, that's built by a desire to be obedient and faithful to God, that that's secure, it's safe, it's trustworthy, it's not going anywhere. Then in Matthew 6, 22 through 23, he teaches us about the lamp of the body, how that's the eye and ultimately the heart. How if the eye is full of darkness, putting dark things into it, the whole body will be led astray. Here we talked about how it's important to be careful what we focus on and what we look at. We talked about how the heart is ultimately, and the eye, are ultimately going to determine if we're walking over here towards Christ in light, or if we're stumbling around in the darkness over here, lost and directionless. Jesus taught us about judging others, being persistent in our pursuit of God and his kingdom. He taught us about being who we claim to be and not living double lives. He taught us about the importance of building our lives upon the truest foundation there is, the foundation of Christ and his teachings. There's certainly a lot that Jesus taught us when he went up that mountain. And we didn't cover all of it here in Laurel. 
There's a lot more that we skipped over or we didn't really talk about. And even, even today, as I seek to summarize, there are some things that I didn't mention that we did discuss. Jesus gave a lot of teachings when he was on that mountainside. And so with that much instruction and with the raised standards, the higher standards that he has, standards like be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly father is perfect, How's that for a high standard? With standards like that and so much instruction, it can become easy for a Christian to feel kind of overwhelmed sometimes. Especially when we consider how much we as human beings tend to fall short of God, of his expectations, and we fail to listen to the instructions he gives us, not just here, but throughout all of Scripture. It can feel daunting. It can feel overwhelming. In fact, the secular world will look at that and go, well, your God doesn't want you to have fun. Look at all these rules. But we should never allow our hearts to be troubled, not when we have God in our corner, not when he's in our pocket. Because obviously we were going to need help. Obviously, man was never meant to figure this all out on his own. He was never going to be able to do this without the mercy and involvement of Christ. And so we should thank God every day that he is a God who planned ahead. He knew at the beginning we were going to need a helper. He knew at the beginning we were going to need a savior. And he sent us one. He sent us Jesus that Savior who died so that we might live, that Savior who died, conquered sin, and then rose from the dead. God knew what we needed, support, hope, encouragement, forgiveness. You know, that's why he started his sermon the way that he did. Looking back at that first beatitude, what was it? Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are those who know that they need God more than anything else. He did it this way on purpose. He was laying out the foundation for our faith at the very beginning of this sermon. Because without God, none of it matters. Without God, we have no hope. Without Jesus and his sacrifice, there is no future. Blessed are those who are spiritually poor. And we have a Savior, we have a Redeemer, and we have a God who says that we can accomplish the instructions he's given us and that we can meet his expectations. And if God says we can do it, can we do it? Of course we can. We can do it because we're not alone, are we? Not only do we have Jesus, but we have his Holy Spirit living within us. Not only the Holy Spirit, but we have God. Now, let's think on that for just a second. Because this is big, y'all. The God who was there at the beginning, before there was anything else. The God who will be there at the end when there is nothing else. The God who created every single thing and will create every single thing that changes is in your corner. He wants to see you succeed. He's emotionally invested in seeing us succeed. He gave up everything so that we could succeed. The God of creation supports us. And if he's with us, who can stand against us? Nobody can. As we seek to be obedient to him, he has laid out a support group to make it easier for us to do it. And in case we forget... We don't just have God and and, and Jesus and the Spirit with us. We also have one another. And I think this is really big and really important as well. Because we need one another. You can go back to the very first book in the Bible and see that that is a true statement. It is not good for man to live alone. It's not good for him to be alone. We are social creatures. We need one another. We need each other's support and encouragement. We were never meant to do this walk towards God on our own. It wasn't the plan. It's not his design. 
Because there are going to be difficult moments in our lives. Moments where we're overwhelmed, where, where the clouds below the plane of our life are so thick, we don't have a clue whether we're flying upside down or right ways up. There are hard moments in every Christian's walk. But he didn't want us to walk on our own. We have him and we have one another. And it's in those difficult moments that we really need to turn to each other. Leaning on one another for love and encouragement and support. When life's kicked us down and we don't think that we can get back up, we need to be asking for help. I've heard it said that asking for help is a sign of weakness. Some people actually believe that. I know when I was younger, I certainly did. Asking for help is not a sign of weakness. Asking for help is a godly action. We do it every time we pray to God, don't we? Lord, give us this day our daily bread. Lord, help me through this. These are my needs. Asking for help is a good thing, and it's something we all should be in the habit of doing more than perhaps we do. Madison said that I shouldn't introduce this next part the way that I'm about to, so if she's like looking at me funny, this is why. Um, she doesn't like the use of the word old. There's this old Batman movie. It's one of the Christian Bale ones. There's this old Batman movie with a line in it that if you haven't seen the movie, I want to tell you about it. And if you have seen it, I want to remind you about it. Because I personally think this line is profound. But you have Bruce Wayne, and he's, he's walking the family grounds before he becomes Batman. And he trips and he falls down a well. And his father goes looking for him, and his father finds him, runs back, gets a rope, comes back to him, lowers the rope down to help him up, and he asks his son this question. He says, why do we fall, Bruce? There it is. Somebody saw the movie. So that we can learn to pick ourselves back up. I like that line. I think it's a good line. I think for Christians, it is just a little different, though. I think for Christians, the question becomes, what do we do when we fall, brothers and sisters? And the answer, I believe, is we learn to let Jesus and our brothers and sisters help us back up. We support one another. We encourage one another. Because we're going to stumble. We're going to fail. We're going to fall. These are inevitabilities. There are days even where we're going to feel very overwhelmed. That one particular sin that we've been struggling with for so long, it feels like it's going to win. It feels like it's pushing us back. But if we lean on one another, if we're honest with one another, if we're open with one another, we talked about this yesterday at the men's retreat as well. If we do those things, we're not fighting that sin on our own. We've got support. We've got hope. And we can do it. Now, I know it can be hard sometimes, can't it? To trust in God that he's got control, that he's going to take care of those obstructions. It can be hard to trust other Christians sometimes as well. That can be really challenging. But as a Christian, we have a job to do. There's a task that has been laid out for us. We see it right there. Encourage one another in love and good deeds. And we see it throughout all of Scripture. Take a moment to flip over to 1 Thessalonians 5.14. When a brother or sister is coming to you, and they're saying, I'm having a hard time with this, or I'm struggling with this, or I don't know what to do, and I need some guidance. Be the kind of Christian that they need. The kind of Christian that First Thessalonians tells you to be. We urge you, brothers and sisters, warn those who are idle and disruptive. Encourage the disheartened. Help the weak. And here it is. Be patient with everyone. 
We've got a job to do, y'all. We've got a job to do. God is giving the instructions and we need to obey them. And when we feel confused or overwhelmed or lost and directionless, we have to trust him. And when we need a little extra support, we have it right here, right now, every time we gather. We all walk around with these ridiculous little squares in our pocket that make it oh so easy for us to get in touch with people at any point of the day. We can work together and we can accomplish what God wants us to accomplish because that's how he designed things. Let's just follow his instructions. Let's trust, let's obey, and let's be his. He's going to take care of our landings. The planes will come down safe and sound if we trust and we obey. If you've not yet started your journey with with Christ this morning and you're ready to be baptized, the water's ready. Like every Sunday, the only question is, are you? And if there's something on your heart or on your mind and you feel like you just need encouragement, now's a great time to come forward or you can grab somebody after service while we stand and while we sing.